Look at your neighbor and tell them, design your own Jesus. Look at your other neighbor and say, take off your flip-flops. Or your Crocs, or your Steve Mattons, or whatever you're sporting today, your Tom shoes. Here we go. This is Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 and 15. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither or no, he replied. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell on his face to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your tevas. For the place where you are standing is holy, and Joshua did so. Look at your neighbor say, Design your own Jesus. Look at your other neighbor say, take off those flip-flops. Let's go to two more scriptures. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke 6. If you're new to the Bible, just look at your neighbor and say, can I look at your scripture? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Kind of at the Grammys, the Emmys, the Oscars, after the Lakers lose... Or when, how many people we've seen, I want to thank my Lord and Savior. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And then Luke chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their own self? Everyone say, design your own Jesus. Now, I don't know if you know this, man, but you could design anything. You could design your own Facebook page, and you could put nice-looking pictures of yourself on the Facebook page. You could design your own Tom shoes and write your name on them if you want. You could design your own Twitter account. You could follow me on Twitter, at Pastor Jude, if you want to. (laughs) And, you know, everybody's designing anything they want. You could go on Craigslist or eBay. You could even design your own underwear if you want. You could have boxer briefs and just put praying hands right there. Glory to God. (laughs) You could wear whitey tighties and say sanctified. (laughs) You could even order some invisible briefs and it's just called roughing it. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. There's so many things that you could design. And you know, people want to design their own Jesus. Some people want a happy Jesus. They're saying, Jesus, I'm tired. I'm depressed. Can you be happy? And they just want Jesus to be happy. There are other people, they want the matchmaking Jesus. (laughs) It may be a young man say, Lord, I will serve you for the rest of my life. Give me that girl over there. Thank you, Jesus. That's kind of like the Jane Austen Jesus, the matchmaking Jesus. And how does that look? I mean, there's some women today say, oh, Lord, I just want to be married. And they just want Jesus to give them a hookup. You know what I'm talking about? So you got the happy Jesus. You got the matchmaking Jesus. Some people want one of those prosperity Jesuses with rhinestones all over the beard. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Jesus is called the bling bling Jesus. God, give me some bling bling. (laughs) I mean, people want Jesus to just load them up. You know what I'm talking about? 
They're saying, Lord, when we get to heaven, there's going to be gold. There's going to be doors of pearl. There's going to be rubies and diamonds and emeralds. Lord, acclimate me. Come on, bling, bling. <laughs> And some people want the happy Jesus. They want the matchmaking Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'll serve you if you just give me some money. Other people want the workout Jesus. They want Jesus to be their personal trainer. Give me one more. You will get buns of steel and abs of steel right now. And they just want Jesus to give them the body they want, the money they want, the girl they want, the boy they want. Some people want Jesus to be the therapist like Dr. Phil and be understanding. That's how understanding people look at you when you pour out your heart. If you don't know what they're talking about, just kind of tilt your head and act like you bit into a lemon. It doesn't work if you have Botox, but he'll try it. And everybody wants Jesus to be so many things. They want the happy Jesus, the workout Jesus, the marketplace Jesus. Oh, come on. Jesus, help me make the deal. I am the deal. You are the deal. Get the deal. They want Jesus to be the workout Jesus, the matchmaking Jesus, the happy in Jesus. In California, they even have Jesus. It's the party in Jesus. And they have a shirt. And, and he has a blunt, better known as a doobie, right here. <laughs> Whoa, Lord, Messiah, fire, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? People want to make Jesus to fit their every need. But Jesus is challenged. There's a problem. Jesus can help you with your money, help you get a spouse, help you with your body, help you get happy. But before he's anything, Jesus thinks he's God. Jesus is Lord. He made the galaxies, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth. Jesus is God, and he wants you to treat him like that. Now, all throughout raising children, I have three sons, and my middle son's here today. This is John, and he's single, and he's good looking. He looks just like his mama. We throughout their life have had talks. We talked about so many things throughout the last 22 years of parenting. The first talk I ever had with the boys, I guess I would call it the mommy talk. And, and you see, girls are smart. I mean, after God made the woman, he made her from the man, and he said, this is bad. This is a crescendo of all my creation. You know what, angels? I can't do any better than that. I'm going to sit down. Get me a latte. Extra hot. No foam. Thank you, please. But when he made the man, he made him out the dirt. And that's why men get dirty. But women know how to get into men. Amen? Because they came from the man. Now, women are so smart. They figure things out so early. I'm sure when the little girl was about two years old, Mommy, I don't like my room. It's green. It's pink. Mommy, let's change it right now. And, and they went to the home shopping network. You know what I'm talking about? Boys, not boys. <laughs> I like my room. It smells like poopy. Yeah. <laughs> we, ha we have boys, and we've had talks. I remember the first talk, really, we had with the boys. It was called the mommy talk. And they came in the bathroom. My wife probably just stepped out of the shower. I don't know. Maybe they were about three or four. Daddy, why is mommy different than us? I'm thinking, man, come on. Let's have a talk. <laughs> and I said, well, mommy is like a bait. No, mommy's like a football player. Mommy has helmets and pads. <laughs> I said, daddy and you, we like a baseball player. We have hats and bats. They said, okay. Then we put the baseball hat on. <laughs> then the next talk we would have, and the years would pass, and it was the sex talk. 
And I'm sure parents throughout the ages kind of feared this talk. And that's why maybe some of you, your parents never talked about this. But when our oldest came of age and we went to another room and said, you know, I need to talk to you. What about? And I began to say, you know, I saw your mom. Where did you see her at? In church. I was worshiping. I thought, she is my reality. <laughs> Game on. No. <laughs> And so I began to explain to him, she liked me, I liked her. And then all of a sudden, I said, we got Mary. And I said, then she couldn't keep her hands off me. <laughs> and I said, there you go, Merry Christmas. That's how you came about. I said, do you have any questions? And my oldest son says, yeah, I have one question. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I wonder what it is. He said, so we have three sons. You guys did that like? three times? And I go, uh, not exactly. <laughs> he said, well, how many times? I said, uh, let's have that talk when you're 22 years old. <laughs> and so throughout the years, we had the mommy talk, the sex talk. When you go spend the night for the first time at another person's talk, and if they ever try to hurt you, knife them, shank them, cut them, scream, and come home. We had the talk when they got their first job, when they got their driver's license. We had talks all throughout their life. In Joshua, this isn't Joshua's first time into the promised land. He had seen Jericho before. He was much younger. He was 40, but now he's 80. And it wasn't just him. There was only one other person that had seen Jericho, and that was his BFF, Caleb, best friends forever. And they were the ones who had a heart that wholly followed God. Their spirit and their attitude was right. And so it's the night before they're supposed to go take up this impossible fortified city. And Joshua's trying to get his game on. And I don't know, maybe he's kind of doing what football players, boxers do. He's probably got his iTunes in just trying to psych himself up, thinking what is our strategy going to be? And he's just trying to figure this out. And all of a sudden, we're talking about Mel Gibson. We're talking about the Patriot, Braveheart, shows up. And, and Joshua is 80 years old. Now, if you're walking and you have your, your worship going on and you're just trying to get a victory and you're just like, yeah, Lord, yeah, and you see this buff angel, you're going to probably go, ah, and you run. <laughs> but Joshua is 80 years old. But that's okay. 80's a new 70, 70's a new 60, 60's a new 50, 50's a new 40, 40's a new 30, 20's a new 10, and my goodness, in Jesus you could be 80 and you're an infant, amen? <laughs> and in the Bible says, Joshua, when he sees this big, massive army dude, commander, I'm the commander-in-chief of the army, that Joshua doesn't back up, but he literally gets his sword and he runs towards this being. And he says, are you for me? Or are you for our enemies? It's on like Donkey Kong. You want some of me? <laughs> and the angel of the Lord says something. He said, no. We need to have a talk. Saying, hey, are you going to do what I've had? No. We need to have a talk. And Joshua bows down, and he takes off his tevas. Now, this is going to shock some of you, but there were Old Testament sightings of Jesus before Jesus became Jesus. It's not like Elvis. Oh, we just saw Elvis in Manila. No, you didn't. <laughs> Jesus appeared on the earth before Jesus was Jesus, because Jesus was always Jesus. Jesus didn't have a beginning. Jesus didn't have an end. Jesus is Jesus, and he's the son of God, and that means he always existed. And the way he would manifest was the angel of the Lord. Now, we're not talking about one of those angels in the outfield that you wear on your collar when you go to court. We're not talking about one of those little angels that help you through your life. We're talking about the angel that created all the other angels. We're talking about the angel that spoke and light came out of darkness. We're talking about the angel in the earth appeared. So did the sun, the moon, Venus, Venus, and Jupiter. We're talking about the angel that always existed. That's God. It's Jesus. He's Lord. Amen. It happened to Abraham. 
Abraham's walking, all of a sudden the angel of the Lord appears and Abraham begins to bow down. All of a sudden, they had this one guy, his prophet, one nine hundred donkey. His name is Balaam. <laughs> and Balaam's on his donkey. Yeah, I'm going to get mine. You know I am. I'm getting, I'm getting some prosperity right now. And all of a sudden, the donkey goes off the road because he didn't have a GPS system that picked up the angel of the Lord. And the donkey begins to crush Balaam's foot. And then all of a sudden, the donkey sits down in the middle of the road, and Balaam begins to beat that donkey, saying, Ma'am, what are you doing? And all of a sudden, Balaam's eyes are open, and the donkey says, Why are you beating me? Kind of sounds like Eddie Murphy and Shrek. <laughs> Am I being good to you? And all of a sudden, some of you come in. When Shadi got up here today and started talking about redeem, you could feel something in the very atmosphere. Faith is not something you try to get. You could go get something on Craigslist and eBay and you just design all you want. But when God comes into your life, before he's your healer, before he's your counselor, before he's your matchmaker, before he's your bling bling, he's God. He's God. He's God. And if a donkey knows how to worship, it literally means you just bow your knee. You surrender. And that night, the uncreated angel, the God of gods, the king of kings was saying, no, wrong question. Don't ask me if I'm for you. You know I'm for you. Bow your knee. And it's something about when Jesus Christ becomes the Lord of your life. And I just want to ask this, why does Jesus have to be Lord? For real. Why does Jesus have to be Lord? What's the hang-up? Well, number one, he thinks he's God. Number two, he deserves it. And number three, he's the only one in the universe that will control you without destroying you. You said, nobody's controlling me. Mm -mm, come on, girl. Oh, yeah, I've seen men control women, women control men, substance control people, money control people, power control people, fame control people. Somebody's going to control you, but it will destroy you. But when you come to Jesus as Lord and you bow your knee, he will never destroy you. And you accept him as Lord and God, walls begin to fall. There are citadels and walls that are around this city and nation. There are walls into education. You say, when will the Philippines belong totally to God? When every person in New Life and every New Life campus begins to make Jesus Christ Lord. Jesus wants to be Lord of your money, Lord of your mind, Lord of your education, Lord of your entertainment. God doesn't want to take back seat in your life. Jesus wants to be Lord. And when he's Lord, walls come down. Victories are won. Churches are built. Bodies are healed. Jesus Christ is Lord. Have you ever compared your child to another child in the church? Have you ever seen someone's child maybe at the mall and the child's throwing themselves down? And you say, that baby has a devil, but not my baby. My baby is smart. My baby is kind. My baby is important. <laughs> and then... Just think about this. Tell your baby no. Mommy, can I have some white sugar? I want a candy. No. And that baby slaps mommy. Mommy, I want candy now. <laughs> you know what's funny about living in California? People in California don't spank their children. I'm from Louisiana. We're like the Filipinos. We beat our children. I mean, come on, there's this California gal. Her little boy's probably named Cody. And Cody said, Mommy, I want candy. No, Cody. No, Mommy, I want candy. Cody, relax. Cody, simmer. No, he hits his mom across it. Cody, 
simmer now, Cody. Time out, Cody. Uh-uh. Not my mama. You tell mama, no. She said, boy, I'll beat you into, uh-uh. No, uh, no, you didn't. I mean, come on. You will know when Jesus Christ is Lord, when he tells you no. When he tells you no, you can't date that boy. And you've got to give up that girl. And I need you to give 10% of your income because I want you to build the church in Nepal. You will know when Jesus is Lord when he tells you no. I mean, is that all Jesus is going to be? Remember that Pez dispenser in the 70s and the 80s, if you've lived that long? And you pull the head back and a little candy comes out. And you pull the head back and the candy comes out. Is that what it ain't Jesus? Give me some money. Yes. Jesus, give me anyone I want. Yes. Jesus, give me a career. Yes. Jesus, let me do whatever I want to do. Yes. Jesus, just help me. Yes. Jesus, just do that. Yes. When is the last time God said no? When is the last time God said no? You're not going to go preach here. You're going to preach here. When is the last time God said no? I want you to bow your knee. You will know when Jesus is Lord when he tells you no. And it's something about Jesus. He's not going to take back seat. Jesus, come in the car. Can you sit in the back seat, please, and fix me a latte? Okay, thank you, Lord. Jesus isn't even going to call shotgun. He's not going to get in the passenger seat. Jesus wants to drive the car of your life. You know what's interesting? We bought each of our sons a car. We just got the youngest one a car in about December. About a month later, I said, give me the keys to your car. I want your mom to use your car to go to the supermarket or the mall. It's my car. I brought you into the world, I can take you out of the world. <laughs> Boy, I ain't from California, I'm from Louisiana. I'll cut you, knife you, shank you, no. He go, you gonna put gas in the car? How about this, when he's speeding through the neighborhood, you do it again, I'm gonna, it's my car. No, it's not your car. I bought that car. That car is my car. I'm letting you use that car and never forget it. It's something about Jesus. He can't take the passenger seat. It's not in him to take passenger seat. If Jesus is going to come into your life, before he heals you, before he gives you a spouse, before he opens a door for your business, before he helps you work out, Jesus has to be who Jesus is, and that is Lord. He's got to be in the driver's seat. And it's something about Jesus. Especially if you're young, you want God to go fast and furious. Give me my destiny now. That Jesus drives like your grandmother. Ah, oh, don't you like this drive? Can you smell the durian? No. Oh, smells like hell, tastes like heaven. No. You know what's weird about Jesus? He will get in a car and he will put it in neutral and just stop for days. You go, God, I got to get there. God, when you're going to answer my prayer, it's something about Jesus. When he's driving the car, he gets off the interstate. He likes going the scenic route. So you prayed and asked God for something for three years, five years, ten years. There were things that were spoken into the heart of this church over 20 years ago and still have not come to pass. And you're thinking, God, when is this going to happen? 
Can you imagine having something that literally was promised 400 years before? There have been things that have been spoken over these islands that will come to a reality in your day. And why? Because there are going to be a multitude of people who have made Jesus Christ Lord of their life. They're going to say, God, get in the driver's seat. Here's the keys. And I'm telling you, my friend, education will begin to open up. Media will begin to open up. Health sciences will begin to open up. We will begin to to grow churches that will literally take over entire regions. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess to the glory of the Father. Jesus is Lord of the Philippine Islands. He owns every one of them. He owns Asia. Come on! That night, that old warrior saying, are you for me or against me? And God said, neither. And he bowed his knee. And he says, what would my Lord say to his servant? He said, take off your shoes. Take off your Crocs. Take off your flip-flops. You know what that represented? Take off your life. And the Bible says, whoever keeps their life, you lose it. You give your life, you gain it. They had three men 2,000 years ago that hung on a cross outside of Jerusalem. One of them said, hey, Lord, get me off this cross, and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I need a jailbreak, Jesus. But then they had another one at the other side. He didn't go through Bible college. He didn't go through New Believers class. He said this one thing, Lord, remember me. Remember me. Today you're with me. And right now God is encountering you. And a strong faith does not come from just a little Jesus, a demigod. A faith that will change a family, a person, or a nation comes from lordship. And this is the lordship talk. That Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Gee, it's impossible for Jesus to sit in the back seat of your life. It's impossible for him saying, well, yeah, I'm kind of going to church, but I still kind of do my own thing. No, he wants to rule your life. How many of us know people are ruled by drugs, money, fame, the opposite sex, things in business? Come on! Jesus wants to control you, but he will not destroy you. And you say, what is lordship? Number one, it's complete. If he's not lord of all, he's not lord at all. He wants to be lord of everything. It even says in Matthew 7, many on that day will say, Lord, Lord. I want to thank my Lord. Y'all know how Jesus loves me. Yes, I know for the vow. Many will call me Lord. But I'll say... No, I didn't know you. You never bowed. Worship isn't the style of music. It's the bending of the will to Almighty God. And you could be a drug dealer, a teacher. You could have had a lot of stuff or no stuff. Will you bend your knee to Jesus Christ? Will you bow your knee to Jesus Christ? Even services. When Shadi was singing, I felt healing power. Many times we don't see some of that because we just got to stick to our schedule. I believe we need to open up the schedule and let him be Lord of the schedule. Lordship has to be personal. He's coming to you right now. Will you let him be Lord? It has to be complete. And you will know when Jesus is Lord, when he tells you no. And I ain't talking about drinking, dancing, and partying. I'm talking about when God says, no, I want you to go to the Philippines, and you're in your 20s. And maybe you could have stayed in the United States, and it would have been easier, and you would have had a great ministry. Jesus' lordship is when he restricts you, and you trust him, and you still obey him. And then all of a sudden, because of your obedience to the know of God, then walls begin to come down. There are walls of hostility in all of Asia. They have this nation against that nation and this religion against that religion. 
But I'm telling you, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is a reality. It will cause literally walls to come down. Those of you who have been divorced, who have been battered, who have been angry, I'm telling you, it's nothing like the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That battle was not going to be won in human power, but it was going to be won because Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on.